sir. Hello, uh, citizens of the Zoomverse. So, uh, so today's going to be our first trial run of the uh, um, of the virtual lecture. So I, I will kind of be the first to admit that I was kind of caught with my pants down a little bit today. So I, I didn't get a chance to test out as much as I could because all the other faculty were kind of hogging all the classrooms. So I just did one lecture just now and, and what I kind of found to be the best because this, this webcam can kind of be blurry and not is I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, go through the lecture notes that are posted online uh, with some kind of annotations and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of kind of narrate through that. So I know it's not the best because I know what's, what's kind of more ideal is that, you know, kind of the setup that we have in the class where we kind of write notes in real time. Um, but I'm going to try to figure out something by Wednesday. But last Friday, you know, it was all basically slammed because everyone was trying to figure stuff out. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to do that by, uh, by Wednesday. It'll be kind of a better setup. But for today, kind of, we'll, we'll just kind of have to screen share and we'll kind of go from, from there. Okay. All right, so I, I apologize for kind of, uh, you know, the setup, but um, you know, I want to make sure that, um, you know, we kind of do this kind of the right way. Because what, what I found was that when I try to do like this, you know, I did like that, you know, first of all, it's backwards. So like that's, that's not ideal. And second of all, it was sometimes it was blurry and kind of came in and out. So I feel like this webcam is not going to be a good method for us to, uh, to do the lecture. So, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do it like this. Okay, uh, so if you're on Zoom, um, the way that we're going to do this is uh, I'm gonna, you're going to go to Titanium, and you're going to download the, uh, the notes. Okay. So the notes for this week is going to be uh, laminar boundary layers. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go through this. And what Zoom allows me to do is it allows me to draw some notes, not in white, because that's awful. Let's do red. Okay. So what Zoom is going to allow me to do is I'm, I'm going to be able to draw uh, kind of annotations like this. And we'll kind of follow along with the lecture notes. On so I know, you know, again, it's, I know it's not ideal, but, you know, um, this is kind of what we'll uh, we'll do, for, to do, and then by Wednesday I'll, I'll have something much better figured out, so we can uh, kind of so you guys can follow along kind of real time. Okay. Um, so for everyone that's on Zoom, so today uh, what I have kind of in front of me is the uh, is the midterms from last Monday. So I finished grading them. Uh, so your scores should be on titanium at this point. Um, um, but, you know, obviously, if you're not here and, uh, um, you know, this is our last class session before we go virtual for a long time, that there's no way for you guys to pick up the exam. So what I'm going to do instead is that, you know, I, I know some of you have emailed me already, um, is that I'm going to scan, if you want me to, I can scan your uh, midterm exams for you and then uh, email the PDF. Okay? Uh, so if you want me to do that, then, uh, then just uh, let me know. Just email me and then uh, I can uh, scan the, the documents and, and send you. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing that. For, I'm guessing probably almost every day this week because uh, I know people are gonna be in and out of the lectures and stuff like that. So uh, so just send me an email when you can, and then I can uh, upload the, the lectures or the uh, your midterms. Average, average of the midterm was thirty six point six out of fifty. So that's about a seventy three percent. Most people didn't say thirty six percent. Oh no. no. <laughs> No, you guys did well. No, I think that's a good average. Above 70, I think is only a good average. Yeah, yeah, you can. So actually, you guys want it right now, so you guys are here. You know, we still have some time. You guys can pick it up.
Hi. <clears throat> How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Are you in there? Yeah, trying to. <laughs> you any shopping this weekend? No. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, man. <laughs> right? I'd rather do food mechanics. <laughs> Stay home and be safe. <laughs> Oh, man. I ran out of rice oh, last yeah? week and it was, it was crazy. I didn't go to like six different markets just to find a bag of Oh rice. my God. And I was lucky just because I, I found one, I found a market they had just restocked. Oh, really? Um, so I, I was really lucky that I found one. <laughs> but other than that, they were all gone. Yeah. Oh my God. That's crazy. Um, what was the average for this? It's 36.6 out of 50. Wow. That's um, pretty high. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. He's good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so you guys are just coming in if you want to pick up your exam. I, I've already graded up. So the grades are on titanium. The average was 36.6 out of 50, so about 73%. You guys do that. I'm, I'm going to get started. Okay, uh, so let's get started. So it's seven o'clock. Uh, so welcome everyone to our, our first kind of half virtual lecture, right? So we kind of have some people online and we have some people in the class. So this is kind of a, a weird thing kind of for, for everyone. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm very much in the, you know, if you guys weren't here earlier, you know, I'm very much in the mode of, you know, I'm still kind of trying out to see what works best. Um, so, you know, I, you know, just little history. I, I only just started teaching a year ago and it's, it's taken me up to this point to be just somewhat confident, confident about, you know, lecturing on the board. So now, now that, you know, because of the situation, I'm going to have to kind of throw all that out the window and kind of learn a different mode of lecturing. So, you know, I, I'm going to tell you right now that you know, at, at first it's going to be a little bit rough, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be experimenting with different things and seeing what works best. So, you know, I'm going to be relying on your guys' feedback to kind of help me, you know, figure out kind of what, what, what kind of works best for everyone. And, you know, because I, I think we're going to be in this mode for kind of the foreseeable for future. Okay. So I know the, the university date was April 26, uh, but I think, you know, we should be prepared to, uh, you know, be prepared to kind of go the whole way like this, kind of if, if need. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, let me kind of, let me open the chat actually, first of all, so, so you guys can interact. So if someone in the in the room can can say something um, in the chat, and just to set, just to check that I can read it, can someone type? Can someone find some the chat on the on Zoom? Okay, so we got the chat. Cool. Um, all right. So thank thank you guys for testing the chat. So if, for those of you guys that are on Zoom. Uh, so I'm basically my face is going to be glued right here to the screen just to make sure the audio is okay. Right? Um, so just kind of uh, just type up a question anytime that you have, and then I'll kind of do my best to. Um, okay. Um, so with that, how's everybody doing? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, throughout all this kind of madness and getting things prepared, I think it's important to kind of check up, you know, make sure everyone's kind of mentally okay and, you know, kind of dealing with this crisis. All right. So hopefully, you know, not too many of you guys try to do shopping over the weekend because that was kind of crazy, right? Um, so, uh, so for me, you know, I, I I'm an Asian guy, so I love my rice. I'm kind of like a no <laughs> no rice, no life kind of guy. So, you know, it was very. I, I ran out of rice last week, so it was. I had a very hard weekend. Um, I was very sad on Saturday because I couldn't find any markets with rice in them. Um, but on Sunday, I went to a market where they, they had just restocked, so I, I have a bag of rice, so now I'm, I'm, I'm happy. So I think I'm ready to survive at least another month or so until I run out of rice. Okay, so hopefully your guys was a uh, rice or rice. It's okay. I, I think I think I'm good. I, I, I have enough rice to keep me. Down. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right. So uh, are there any kind of questions about kind of the, the midterm? So I know, you know, people in the class are kind of looking through that right now. Um, I'll post a solution. So I'll, I'll scan the solutions in tomorrow too. So tomorrow morning, we'll just be kind of just scanning a bunch of stuff. Um, so kind of maybe after that, if you guys have questions on the midterm questions then, or maybe right now, if you have questions on the midterm, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, are there, are there any questions? Yeah. What was the highest score? 
highest score. Oh, I usually don't pay attention to that. I think um, <laughs> highest score. I don't think anyone got a hundred. Um, I think the highest score was probably forty-eight. I want to say. I do remember. I do remember someone got a forty-eight on, on the exam. Um, I think. So yeah, so this is actually a good time to talk about grading policy. So, uh, so in terms of grades, I, 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 I don't curve my class in the traditional way, but what I do is, what I think is, is a little bit simpler. So what I do is that at the end of the class, what I do is you, after all the grades are in, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compute the overall class average. So you, you can kind of, you know, probably you guys can see, but I can kind of see the overall class average right now. Um, and what I like, especially, I think especially for grad classes, since you guys need kind of a B to kind of pass these classes, I'll make the class average around like 83%, so things would be right? um, um, So basically for every point that where the class average is under that average of 83%, I'm gonna add a flat amount of points to everyone's grade such that the class average is up to that. Okay. Um, so I think right now the class average is 48 out of 60. It's kind of kind of right on the nose. So that, that's about an 80%. Uh, so if the class were to end today, I would add kind of three three percentage points to everyone's grades and have bumped everyone's like that. Okay. So I expect that to kind of come down, that class average to kind of come down a little bit because you guys have been doing really well on the homeworks. Um, so the homeworks are kind of inflating things a little bit right now. So you know, as the second midterm goes in and as the final exam goes in, I think that's going to come down a bit. So you know, if, if things kind of trend the way they are, don't, I mean, I don't know what this number is going to be until the end, but I expect maybe I'll add maybe five, six, seven points to everyone's grade. You know, kind of bump, bump the average up to, to the beginning. Question? Uh, no, I, I'm just like, um, curious about like midterm number two. So mm -hmm. are, are it going to be like online or? Yeah, so the, for, so the, que so the question um, for on Zoom is, you know, what's going to happen with midterm two? Because right now I think midterm two is scheduled for the middle of April. Uh, which is, you know, when we're still technically going to be, you know, not on virtual. Um, so the answer right now is I, I, I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm toying with the idea of uh, having a, a take home exam. I think that might be the, uh, um, that might be kind of the cleanest thing to do, especially, you know, if what I'm, what I'm guessing is that this, this quarantine might extend further past the April 26th deadline. Cause I know there's some other schools, like I know uh, UCLA, they've kind of said their entire spring quarter is going to be online and their quarter goes all the way up until kind of the middle of June. Uh, so if they're going to go online all the way till June, I think, you know, there's going to be some pressure from to Cal State Fort and kind of, you know, to keep it all the way up until then too. Um, so if, you know, if we're going to be virtual all the way up until the end, I think a take home exam might be kind of the best thing because there's what the school is allowing us to do is that they're allowing us to kind of, you know, bring people in just, just to do an exam. Um, so we can, we can request for, uh, for basically, we can petition the team's office to kind of have a day where we can come in. Um, but, you know, the whole point of this, this quarantine is to stop the spread of the disease. So, you know, if we all come in for an exam, that kind of defeats the purpose of it. Uh, so I don't want to bring you guys in unless it's, you know, absolutely, absolutely necessary. So I think what I, what I would prefer right now is probably a take home exam of, of some point. Maybe I'll upload an exam and I'll, we have 24 hours to, to do it. Yeah. So for office hours, or asking questions, it has to all be done right? Yeah. So the, so the question is, you know, what's going to happen for, for office hours. So, for office hours, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be using the Zoom platform too. Um, so I'll, I'll basically send you guys a link um, and basically, you know, I'll, I'll be in my office. I ordered a webcam for my office, so it's not gonna come here until Wednesday, but tomorrow I'm gonna bring my laptop to, uh, um, to my office. And basically, if you wanna talk during office hours, you can just click that link and you'll be connected to me instantly. And then, you know, you can have office hours that way. Uh, I'll be here on campus. So actually, technically the campus is still gonna be open. So if you still feel okay coming to campus, then, you know, you can just come to my office kind of, you know, just kind of as you normally did, either during office hours times or, or not. Um, and then we can kind of meet that way. Um, so I'll, I'll have a Zoom link open during normal office hours, but if you want to meet virtually outside, just send me an email and then I can create kind of a, a, a custom room for you. You can, you can chat that way as well. <laughs> Don't don't get too excited. Take home exams, you know, they have to be bumped up in difficulty quite significantly to uh, uh, to make up for the fact that they're take home. So uh, um, so be prepared for that. That's, that's all I say. Okay. Uh, any more questions on you know just how the class is going to go and uh, um, or just kind of anything about the class before we start today? What's the average of the test? Sorry, came a little late. Average was thirty six point six out of fifty, so about a seventy three percent.
Okay, so if there's no more questions, let, let's go ahead and get started. Right. So we're starting a new unit today. So the unit that we're going to be going over is boundary layers. Okay. Um, so boundary layers, you know, I'll say that, you know, we'll probably spend one week and we actually might spend uh, the one lecture next week going over it because boundary layers is a very, very deep and rich, um, you know, field um, where even three lectures is not going to do it justice, but, you know, we're going to do our best. Uh, so what I have right now prepared, this is, this is supposed to be kind of one, one week's worth of content, but I think, you know, probably next week, um, just because, you know, I'll be fighting with the system quite a bit more, I think. We'll probably stay on this boundary layer stuff and we'll kind of cover some more different aspects but boundary layers you know we can spend you know two or three different weeks on this but you know since there's a lot of other interesting stuff that we want to go over i'm kind of limiting it but you know uh, but boundary layers is something that's that's really important okay? um so here are all the learning objectives that we're going to go over okay so first thing that we're going to go over is we're going to you know first define what a boundary layer is and kind of you know explain why it forms uh we're going to describe some engineering situations where boundary layers are important okay um Another thing that we'll do is that um, uh, there's various ways that you can define what's called the thickness of the boundary layer. So we're going over that. And then probably the last thing that we'll do today is we'll, we'll you know, we'll state kind of what the boundary layer equations are um, and, uh, you know, how we got there and, you know, kind of explain what each of the terms does. Okay? And then on Wednesday, probably what we'll do is we'll start going over some of the analytical methods, which is the, the Blasius solution. And then we'll explain some kind of more uh, specialized topics like transition, turbulence, separation and uh, okay uh, so with that we have our first lecture and we're going to get underway okay. okay so here we have laminar boundary layers okay. so let me kind of zoom in a little bit or not it's okay okay so uh, let's see bring up the pen so kind of up to this point in the class you know we've you know the title of this class is advanced viscous flow right so what we've said was that, you know, most of the time where you see flows where viscous effects are important are flows that are usually confined to, to small spaces. Okay? So we've always, you know, you know, I think last week is kind of kind of the biggest example of this where we did lubrication theory. Right? So the big thing with lubrication theory was that you always um, were considering um, flow phenomenon that was confined into a very, very small space. Right? So in these situations, there was, uh, um, you know, usually one length scale. And it's usually quite small. Okay. So if you think about our lubrication case, that was the uh, that was the direction that was kind of perpendicular to the flow, right? Or that was kind of the thickness of the film. Um, so what this allowed us to do was that when we computed the Reynolds number of those situations, that Reynolds number was also really really small. Okay. And you know, and we know that when the Reynolds number is small, then viscous effects are important. Remember, the Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial effects in the fluid, um, which are usually given or scaled by the velocity, and then which are uh, and it's divided by the viscous effects, which are scaled by the viscous um, the viscosity of the fluid. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so when the Reynolds number is really small, then we know um, kind of viscous effects are important. Okay? Um, but you know, one other thing that I kind of want to bring to your attention to kind of act as kind of a prelude for boundary layers is kind of one additional feature of all of those flows that we've considered so far. Okay. okay, so kind of as an example, let's look at um, pressure driven flow in a channel. Okay. Uh, so this is a this is a, a situation that we've solved, um, you know, in the lectures and in the homeworks. Okay. And what we've found was that when you have this, you know, flow that's confined between two different plates, um, you know, and it's driven by pressure. So upstream right here, we have dp dx. Right. So if you're on Zoom right now, I'm, I'm writing with my mouse, so it's going to be awful. Um, but hopefully you guys can, uh, can read that. That's dp dx, right? Um, so whenever you do have that, um, or you have flow that's driven by dp dx, or, you know, sometimes it could be gravity, what tends to happen is that your velocity profile is parabolic. Okay. So this is kind of the kind of the visual depiction of that, where you have the velocity u of y, and it follows this kind of parabolic shape. Okay. So as you go from one plate to the other, it forms this parabola. Okay. And so what I want to kind of draw your guys' attention to is that this velocity is going to change rapidly. Over the width of this uh, of this plate. Okay. Okay. 
So as you go from one plate to the other, you're gonna go from basically zero velocity at the bottom plate. Then you're gonna to go to a max velocity at the middle right here. Okay? And then at the top plate, again, you're gonna be at zero velocity. Okay? And remember the, the stipulation for these kinds of flows is that this um, gap width H is usually something that's extremely small. Okay? So over an extremely small area of space, you have what you, what you have are kind of really rapid changes of velocity. So you go from zero to something that's big, back to zero. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I just swallowed my spit. I, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> just to, you know, I, that, that's the calm to guy, calm everyone down in the, that's, that's in the lecture. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so in other words, you know, the, the way that we kind of mathematically represent this is that the velocity gradient which is given by this quantity del u or nabla u, right? This is something that's really, really large, right? So remember kind of back when we did uh, fluid kinematics, we kind of computed this velocity gradient, right? <laughs> now I, uh, I, I literally just, uh, I just, I just swallowed my spit. It's, uh, I'm okay. Um, right. there's, a, there's a nervous laughter in the, in the class. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, okay, and so we know that if the velocity gradient is uh, uh, is significant, then we know the viscous shear stresses are going to be significant. Okay, because we know that the, the the formula for the viscous shear stress is given by this. So we have tau is equal to our viscosity u times the velocity gradient. Okay. Um, so in addition, so basically, kind of the upshot of this is that in addition to situations where the Reynolds number is small, then if you also have situations where the velocity changes rapidly. then in those situations, you're going to have really significant viscous effects. Okay. So we can kind of start to generalize or kind of look at the other different, different situations other than, you know, either when the flow is really small or when, you know, we're confined to small spaces. You know, let's start to think about situations where this, we have this kind of really rapid change in velocity. Okay. Uh, are there any questions on, on this so far, either from folks in class and folks that are outside class? So let me clear these. Okay. Oh, you guys figured out emojis. That's good. <laughs> okay. So let's come down. So let's look at a situation where we actually do have kind of a rapid change in velocity, okay? which is not kind of a traditional place where, you know, that we've been looking at so far. Okay. So let's look at um, an external flow. So let's consider, for example, the rapid flow over a flat solid surface. Okay. Um, so, you know, an engineering situation like this could be, you know, probably the most common that you would see would be kind of the airflow over an airfoil. Okay. So this U infinity right here, this guy is really, really big. Right? So those are greater than signs, right? I've always been taught that greater than signs are, you know, they basically act as alligators or Pac-Man. So they always try to eat the stuff that's bigger. So the fact that there's four, I'll put a fifth one. There's going to be five Pac-Man, you know, this U infinity is going to be really, really big. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the free stream um, condition. So, you know, usually when, when you consider things with infinity, those, um, those refer to the free stream. Uh, and then, but as that flow goes over this plate, we know that this plate right here is a solid. Okay? And so because the plate is a solid, we know that we have this thing called the no slip condition, right? Um, so because of the no slip condition, our velocity has to be zero. So, you know, we have two kind of very different situations here. We're kind of outside the plate or kind of a little bit far away from the plate. We have a fluid velocity that's really, really big. Okay, we have U infinity. Uh, at the plate, we have a velocity of zero. Okay? And then, you know, so it kind of makes sense that, you know, as we go from the plate and kind of away from the plate, we have to have kind of very rapid changes in velocity. So if we consider actually a point P right here, okay, um, where this P could be, you know, some distance over the plate, where this P, it has to have some velocity that could be in between the free stream velocity, U infinity, and zero at the plate, okay? And it could be kind of anywhere in between. Okay. So just like we said, so because the fluid comes to, um, because of the no slip condition, the fluid that comes in contact with the plate must come to a complete stop. Okay. 
And so what that means is that as we travel, you know, from the plate and we kind of go away from the plate, then the velocity must change really rapidly over this distance. All right. So let me clear all that. Let's go back. So this region, this thin region where we have this kind of rapid velocity changes, this is what's known as the boundary layer, which is going to be the subject of this week's lectures and probably next week. Okay. So uh, just some just some kind of example applications where boundary layers are really important. Uh, so we talked about airfoils, right? So airfoils boundary layers are extremely important. Okay. Um, so that really determines a lot of the lift and drag characteristics on your airplane. So um, you know, if you're going to be doing any kind of aerospace applications, you need to, you know, it's kind of almost required that you have to know boundary layers really well. Okay? Uh, another thing where boundary layers are going to be important are uh, on heat sinks, believe it or not. Okay? Uh, so if you if you kind of taken any heat transfer classes before, you know that the boundary layer kind of affects, you know, how convective convection heat transfer affects the plates. Right, so that's going to be really important. And just anything where you have a kind of a some solid body that's kind of moving rapidly through the through a fluid. Okay, so one example that I have here is just kind of any spinning rotors. So if you have like uh, like a helicopter blade or some kind of turbine, right? So you have some kind of moving surface that's kind of moving really quickly in the fluid, then you're going to have boundary layers that uh, you know that uh, that are going to form there, and they'll be really important. Okay? Um, so you know, for some kind of a lot of practical engineering stuff, lift and drag which are really important characteristics for if you're doing anything with cars or you're doing anything with airplanes, right? So those are gonna be, um, you know, highly dependent on the boundary uh, layer phenomenon. Right? Uh, so we work in those industries that's gonna be really important. Um, so we won't go through too much about lift and drag unless we cover it again next week. Um, but just know that, you know, a lot of those things are, you know, they're really dependent on the boundary. Okay. So one, um, one kind of really important feature of the boundary layers is that it's going to be really thin. Okay, um, so kind of just like as we saw with lubrication problems, you know, a lot of times the viscous effects are kind of uh, confined to just a very thin layer, kind of that's on top of the surface, right? Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of scale for what that's like. So if we take a you know a Boeing seven thirty seven, um, you know, we take its wing. So the wing has a, a cord length of five point seven one meters at some point among the wing. So it varies, you know, as you go, because the wing is kind of, you know, it varies in, in cord length. So at, at a section where the cord length is 5.71 meters, then the boundary layer, according to, you know, uh, you know measurements that Boeing's have done and by calculations, the, uh, the boundary layer is only about one centimeter thick. Okay? So if you look at these kind of big differences in scales, so we have 5.71 meters in this direction, right? And then you have one centimeter in, in this direction, right? You can see that it's going to be really, really thick. <clears throat> But over that really thin region, remember, you're going to have velocity that's going to be changing really rapidly. So, you know, viscous effects are going to be really important. Uh, so just some terminology before we move forward. So, you know, when we talk about flow that's inside the boundary layer, right? So the key here being inside, we usually call this the inner solution. Okay? Uh, so in the inner solution, we're going to have viscous, viscous effects that's going to be really significant. Okay? Uh, and then outside the boundary layer, I don't know where that sounds coming from. Um, this is called the outer solution. Right? So in the outer solution, the viscous effects are going to be negligible. Um, so you know we're not going to be dealing with the outer solution. So you know the outer solution is usually the subject of things like an aerodynamics class, or I think we have another graduate class here called inviscid flow. Right? So the inviscid flow class is going to be concerned mostly with the outer solution. So we're not going to be considering that in this class we're doing viscous flow. So we're going to be focusing on things that are inside the boundary. And then just, uh, just an important note. So we're going to be specifically talking about boundary layers that form over solid surfaces. Right? But you're going to apply a lot of the same methodology to uh, flows that uh, in, other, in other situations. Okay? So if you, look, if you think about a jet, a wake, uh, or shear layers. Okay? Um, so uh, I think probably the the easiest example I can think of is that if you have a uh, if you think about like a jacuzzi, right? So in jacuzzi they have those kind of water jets that kind of come out. So you have a jet of fluid that's kind of jetted out into like a much bigger jet of fluid, right? So you have you know really fast fluid and you have kind of still fluid on the outside. So 
In those situations, because you have a rapid change of velocity from the jet to kind of the quiescent fluid, then you have boundary layers that form there as well. Okay? So basically, any time that you have a rapid change in velocity magnitude, then you're going to have uh, really important um, boundary layers. Okay? Right. Any questions on, on this before we jump into some, uh, some definitions? Anyone from Zoom? So I know some people joined midway. So everyone on the Zoom, you know, you can access the chat, right? Uh, so the chat is kind of your only way of communicating with me. So I have the chat that's kind of uh, on the, the screen right now. Uh, so if you have questions, you know, feel free to, uh, uh, you know, just type it out in the chat and then I'll, I'll answer it. Okay, so if there's no more questions. Uh, we can go ahead and move forward. So let me clear these, uh, these markings. So let's talk about some definitions. Okay? So, uh, so first, uh, we need to talk about what we mean by the boundary layer thickness. Because okay? we've, we've, we've already seen that the boundary layer is really, really thin. Okay? Um, but you know, I think it's important to kind of discuss how thin is thin and how do we define exactly you know, what's the thickness of our boundary layer. Okay? So we'll be going over three different definitions. Okay? Uh, so they all have kind of a different interpretation. So, um, so the thing about boundary layers is that there's not a you know, there's different ways that you can define it. And actually you end up with very different numbers sometimes depending on what definition you're using. Um, and it all really depends on, you know, what you interpret as, you know, what are the plate conditions and what are the free stream conditions. Okay. Um, because, you know, if you look at a situation usually, like if you, you know, if you were riding on a plane, not right now, of course, but you know, another time when there's no uh, cold pandemic and you, you look over the wing, you can't really see with your eye, you know, where a boundary layer begins and where it ends, right? All you see is just air, okay? So, you know, in order for us to perform any kind of analytical work with it, you really need to kind of, we, we need to kind of have some formal definitions, okay? But there's a few different interpretations on what constitutes thickness and what's not, okay? Okay, so the first one that we'll go over is, is often called Delta 99, okay? Um, so usually the, the symbol that we give the, uh, the boundary layer thickness is the symbol delta, okay? And then we usually add some kind of subscript or superscript to kind of denote, um, you know, what specific definition that we're talking about, okay? So the first one that we'll go over is uh, delta 99, okay? Um, so it's not some kind of a, you know, Saturday morning superhero. It's, uh, it's something that's, you know, that people use. Um, so, you know, kind of going off the def going off the interpretation that we were talking about before, if we think of the if we think of the boundary layer as the as the region where the fluid velocity transitions to zero at the plate, right? So we say that the velocity is zero here, and then from zero it transitions up to the free stream conditions. Okay? So we say you know at this location right here, you know mathematically a lot of times it's hard to do things in 100%. So we say that instead of 100 we'll do 99. Okay? So we say at this position right here at the edge of the boundary layer. If we say that the velocity has kind of increased from zero all the way up to 99% to what the free stream conditions are, right? So if we measure u at this location right here, this u is going to be 0 0.99 times u infinity, okay? Then this is what we define to be the 99% thickness. You can see, um, you know, I, I kind of drawn this dotted line to kind of um, tell you how that thickness kind of evolves in space. Okay? So we can see that the thickness actually changes with x. So the boundary layer thickness is it's not going to be constant over the entire surface, right? So it's actually going to change as we go from the leading edge. So right here is the the leading edge. So this is the edge that kind of first comes in contact with the fluid. So the boundary layer is going to be a minimum at the leading edge, and then it's going to grow as you kind of move along the plate. And then this, uh, this where the, uh, or the kind of the edge, of, at the edge of this boundary layer, according to this definition, the velocity is kind of, we say that it's kind of recovered all the way back to the free stream condition. Okay. And so of course, um, you know, we picked 99%, but that choice was completely arbitrary, right? 
So you can pick another number and you get an equally valid uh, boundary layer thickness definition. Right? Um, so you can use something like 95%, right? or you can do 99.9%. Right? I think 99, delta 99.9 .9 is a little bit hard for people to write, so I think people will stick with delta 99. Okay? Um, but you know, all of these, all these different, no matter what threshold you pick, they're all they're all kind of interpreted the same way. Is that you know, once you once the velocity is kind of recovered back to some percentage of the free stream, then that will be defined as kind of the uh, as the boundary. Uh, so, are there any questions on on this on delta ninety nine? Before we move on. So let's come down. <clears throat> um, so while this is kind of easy to interpret, so it kind of, uh, you know, is consistent with, um, you know, the way that we've talked about the boundary layers before, it's often really difficult to actually measure this in practice. Because okay? you can imagine, you know, in order to actually measure the location where the, the velocity turns up to 99%, you need probes or velocity probes kind of all throughout the fluid. And a lot of times this is just not practical. Like you can't, you can't actually, it's really difficult to actually measure this without some really advanced kind of, you know, flow visualization techniques. Okay. So even though this Delta 99 is kind of the first thickness definition that a lot of people go over, in practice, it's not, it's usually not the most useful thing just because it's, uh, you know, it's hard to actually measure. It's actually hard to, to, uh, to see. Okay. So some that are actually more useful for our computations are given below. Uh, so the first one that we'll go over, and this one's actually used quite a bit, is called the displacement thickness. Um, so what the displacement thickness, uh, how the displacement thickness is defined is that it, uh, it goes off this idea of what's called the velocity deficit. Okay? Uh, because, you know, just as we talked about before, the fluid velocity is going to change from zero at the plate, and then eventually it's going to go up to the free stream. So if we actually uh, plot out the, the spatial distribution of the velocity uh, as a function of kind of the vertical distance, it will usually take some kind of parabolic form like this. Okay? And then if you draw this kind of vertical line from the free stream velocity down, and you kind of look at this kind of shaded area in between um, this dotted line and the actual velocity profile, you can see that there's, there's this kind of what we call like a deficit in velocity. Okay? Um, so this is kind of like a, a kind of like they call it, you know, a region where you know if the surface wasn't there, this is kind of like a lack of mass flow that you know that's caused by the surface. Okay. Um, so what the displacement thickness says is that you know this kind of complicated profile right here, oftentimes it's really hard to get. So what the displacement thickness says is that, okay, if we, uh, if we assume that the velocity everywhere is U-infinity, okay, but that instead we kind of um, cut out this kind of rectangular block, right? This rectangular block like this, okay, where the area of this block is exactly the same as the area of this one. So I, I knew I drew it poorly. Uh, but if you can imagine that this block was maybe cut off a little bit more, and that this has the same, we say that this has the same velocity deficit as this one right here, okay? then the height of this block right here, this is what's called the displacement thickness. And then this is usually given the symbol delta star. Okay? Uh, so just again, so the you know, just to kind of say it in kind of one line. So there's the displacement thickness delta star. This is the thickness of a layer of zero velocity fluid, right? So in this, in this region right here, we assume that the velocity is zero, okay? So you can assume that the velocity kind of, let me kind of clear this out, that the velocity kind of goes from zero and then suddenly there's a step change like that. Okay? So in this region right here, we have no velocity at all. Right? Um, zero velocity fluid that has the same velocity deficit as the actual boundary layer. Okay? So it's important to note so that, you know, when we draw this picture for this displacement thickness, this is just kind of an imaginary velocity profile. So, you know, obviously this can't happen in practice because we can't have just a very thick kind of drop off right here or very fast drop off. We go from zero 
that all of a sudden we go up to U infinity. Okay? So this is just some kind of a, you know theoretical construct to kind of help us define this boundary layer um, thickness, you know, for the use of calculations. Okay? So mathematically, the way that we compute this is with this formula right here. Right? So we say that delta star is equal to integral from zero to infinity of one minus u, or this u right here, this u is right is the actual velocity divided by u infinity, and then d1. Okay. So unlike delta 99, which has kind of a very you know qualitative kind of a um, you know heuristic definition, the displacement thickness we can actually compute. Okay. It's actually something that's actually used with a lot of um, other boundary layer methods that probably we'll go over next week. Like uh, von Karman and Thwaites use uh, use this displacement thickness. Section one. Right. Are there uh, any questions about you know what the displacement thickness is? Yes. Uh, so if the if we didn't have the no slope boundary condition, then on the left figure, uh, would that area equal the same area on the right figure? So the question is, if we if we didn't have a no slope boundary condition, you know, would this left figure look like the right figure? Uh, so actually, that's a really interesting. Uh, question because actually the way that displacement thickness is actually used in practice is that um, you know it's actually a good segue into this next point is that if you look at um, both of these figures um, you know if I draw them kind of more to scale is that this figure and this figure right even though the one on the left is real and the right one on the right is kind of imaginary they have the same actual mass flow rate, right? so since they have the same velocity deficit if you actually compute the mass flow rate for both of these they'll be exactly the same so actually, what's actually done in practice is that because this velocity profile or this variation is often really, really hard to compute. So we'll, we'll see that even in the most simple cases, it's, uh, it's going to be actually impossible to solve for it. Uh, because this is actually so hard to do, what people do in, in the aerospace industry to kind of simplify their analysis is to assume that, you know, we don't care about this right now. What we'll, what we'll instead assume is that we'll compute this displacement thickness. And then what we'll do actually is that we'll um, displace actually our model up by that amount. So we actually make our solid even thicker. So actually, if we look at this figure right here, what we've done is that after we've computed this velocity uh, thickness delta star, is that we've made our solid thicker. Right? And then what we can what we can do with this kind of thicker model is that we can assume that our velocity will slip here. Right? So we kind of ignore the no slip boundary condition. And then what this model and this model will have is the exact same mass flow. Uh, so actually, you know, that, that is actually used in practice where you, you can actually displace that and actually make your calculations a lot easier. Like if you're talking CFD, if you run a DCFD on this with the slope condition, that's really easy to do compared to this where you have the no slope boundary condition, which is really, really hard. So actually, you know, if you, if you I've, I've never worked at uh, Boeing or NASA, but I assume that this is kind of what they do when they're doing like, uh, when they're designing the airfoils for uh, for airplanes or even for rocket ships, they're not running like a heavy duty two week long CFD with boundary layers. You know, as they're designing and as they're iterating, they're doing something like this, where they can kind of crank out a bunch of simulations really quickly. And then once they get something that they think is good, then they kind of make that for this. But this is kind of just one example of how you can use the displacement thickness in practice, um, you know, without going into the boundary. Any more questions on displacement thickness? Okay. okay. Um, so that's kind of what this paragraph says right here. Okay. So since they both have the same velocity deficit, right? Uh, they have the same mass flow rate. Uh, so if you if you you can use this fact to design, you know, we talked about airfoils where you can use it to design ducts, nozzles, and, uh, and intakes. Okay. Um, so you know, often you know, as we'll see, the boundary layer is so complex. If you can avoid it, um, then that's usually a good thing. Okay, um, then you can uh, you can usually run your calculations a lot more simple, a lot more quickly. Okay, so that's the displacement thickness, right? Um, so there's one more definition of the of the boundary layer thickness that's um, similar. Uh, so if the displacement thickness has uh, something to do with mass flow rate, um, you know, that's kind of like conservation of mass, like we talked about before. Um, so, you know, the other conservation law that we talked about a lot is conservation of momentum. Okay? 
So another um, definition of the momentum thickness is kind of defined in the same way as mass flow, a mass uh, displacement thickness. It's called the momentum thickness. So the momentum thickness is the height of zero velocity fluid that has the same momentum deficit as the real boundary. So the way you compute it is actually very similar to the displacement thickness. So you're going to be performing an integral, so just like you did before, so integral from zero to infinity. But you're going to add this additional term out in front. So you're going to divide um, u by u infinity, and you multiply by 1 minus u over u infinity d1. Okay. okay. Um, so you know we have three different different definitions, and actually a lot of times they can they can differ quite a bit in their numerical values. Okay. But generally they have they kind of follow this rule. So if you uh, if you know the delta ninety nine, that's usually going to be your biggest. Okay. Uh, then the displacement thickness is going to be kind of lower than that, and then your momentum thickness is going to be the lowest out of all of those. Okay. So you know as you know this kind of begs the question about which one is right to use. So you know, they're all right. So they're, they all are correct and they're all valid definitions. It really depends on kind of the application that you're going to be looking at and, you know, how you're going to be uh, considering the boundary. So, we, so, you know, we've already talked about one kind of practical definition for delta star. So if you want to run kind of a, a cheap simulation with slip and you want to maintain the same mass flow rate, you can use delta star. Okay? But, you know, delta 99 has its, um, you know, obvious application just by being simple to understand. And then the momentum thickness is also good, you know, for other, for other things. Okay, are there uh, any questions before we jump into uh, the boundary layer equations? Okay, um, so those are the definitions. Um, so that was kind of nice and not that mathy. So now we're ready to jump in the, into the math, right? So we're gonna be doing our, our favorite activity in this class. So we're gonna be uh, doing some scaling. Okay, so we're going to take our Nadler Stokes equations and we're going to apply some length scales. Okay. So, just like as we have, um, you know, I think for the past three weeks now, so we did this for low Reynolds number flow, we did this for uh, creeping flow, we did this for lubrication theory. Uh, so, now we're going to do the same thing with uh, boundary layers. Okay. So, our endpoint is going to be different. So, you know, we're not going to end up with the same equation, but, you know, how we get there, you know, we're going to be applying a lot of the same, um, same methods. Okay. okay, so let's start. Uh, so we know that, you know, we're, we're eventually going to be non-dimensionalizing the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay? So in order to do that, we need to establish some scales or some basic scalings for some of the different variables. Okay? So first, let's talk about the horizontal velocity. Okay? So for the horizontal velocity, we kind of have a very obvious um, scale here. So we have the free stream velocity u infinity. So we say that uh, if we define u star to be our u divided by u infinity, okay? so this gives us a scale. Uh, for the uh, uh, for the horizontal velocity, okay. uh, for the x coordinate, we'll def uh, we'll define a, uh, a length l. Okay. So l will be kind of the horizontal length of the surface. Okay. Uh, so you know if we have our surface that looks like this, you know the flow is coming this way. Okay. L would be this distance right here. So l would be the distance in, in kind of the same direction as the flow. So if we kind of go back to our example of the Boeing 737, L would be kind of the, the cord length of the, uh, of the wing, okay? And then finally, we have Y, right? So Y, you know, we just spent, you know, a good, you know, half an hour talking about a, a scaling for Y. So one way that we can scale the Y coordinate is we scale it by the thickness, okay? So it doesn't matter what thickness we use, so we can use any of the ones that we talked about. So I'm just going to leave this as a generic delta. So this delta right here, this is the thickness of the boundary. Where thickness, you can use kind of any any definition that you want. So they're all they're all they're they're all going to work because they're all really small. Okay. 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 So one uh, so one big difference with the boundary layer equations that we haven't seen before is that because of the way the boundary layer develops, right? So as we know, the boundary layer is going to grow as a function of a uh, as a function of x. Okay. And so because we have this growth of the boundary layer, what's going to happen is that we actually see some vertical velocity. Okay? Uh, so this is different than before, because before, you know, we, we didn't have any vertical velocity that, um, you know, that we needed to account for. But now we have some vertical velocity. It's going to be really small, um, but in order for us to satisfy conservation of mass, we actually need to account for this vertical velocity. Okay? 
So actually, let's use conservation of mass. So specifically, let's use the continuity equation. And then let's determine at least some kind of scaling for what this vertical velocity is going to be. Okay. So let's start with the continuity equation in 2D. So our continuity equation is going to be d, du dx plus dv dy. And that's going to be equal to 0. Okay. And then the way that we are going to scale it is we're going to plug in all these scales up here. And then eventually, we're going to use this to uh, define a scaling for v. So this V right here, this is going to be the scale for our vertical velocity. And then we're going to use this equation to solve for it. Okay? Uh, so for U, we're going to plug in U infinity, U star. Okay, So that's what we did right here. For X, we're going to plug in L X star. Right? So if we do that, then we, we end up with this term right here. And then for DV dy, when we scale that, we get our unknown velocity scale in the vertical direction. So that's V. And then from dy, what we get is the boundary layer thickness delta. Okay. okay. Uh, so in order for this to be satisfied, what we can do is we can say that because this is dimensionless right here, we can say that it's order one. Okay. And same thing with this guy. Um, so I'm crossing them out, but basically what we're saying is that those are basically order one. Okay. So in order for this to be satisfied, these coefficients or these these ratio of coefficients must be the same. So d uh, u infinity over l has to be the same as delta over or v over delta. Sorry, v over delta. So then if we solve this equation for for v, then what we get is v is equal to u infinity delta over l. Now what we get is this guy. And since we assume that delta is really, really small, then this vertical velocity will also be really, really small. Okay. But, it's, but it's going to be there. So we have some vertical velocity. It's just going to be really, really small. Okay. Uh, but that's going to be important because we're, we're going to need that in our equation. OK, so that's, so that's what we get for, uh, for non-dimensionalizing the conservation of mass. Uh, so this is kind of nice, because up to this point, conservation of mass has been kind of useless. So we haven't really used it in, uh, in our creeping flow or, or in, our, uh, uh, in our lubrication theory. So now it actually gets to do something, which is, which is kind of nice. OK. okay. Um, so the next step is going to be our momentum equations. Okay? So we're going to be performing the same scaling um, um, you know, exercise. But before we do that, we need some scaling on the pressure term, because that's uh, that's an important term that we need to consider for uh, for this um, you know for this kind of field. Okay? Uh, so if you remember from before when we did creeping flow, the pressure term was scaled by some viscous stress. Okay? Uh, but in this case, since outside the boundary layer we have very high uh, velocity flow, okay? uh, so basically we have high Reynolds number flow outside the boundary layer. The way that we're going to scale the pressure is we're going to scale it by the fluid inertia. Okay? So we say that P star is going to be equal to P over rho u infinity squared. Uh, so we're going to use this pressure scaling in for the pressure. Over here. Uh, I think that was a good time. Are there uh, any questions on just you know how we've scaled the Navier-Stokes so far? So conservation of mass, and you know before we jump into conservation of momentum. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, uh, in the in the inner solution, um, you know, what we're saying is that this velocity right here, or the vertical velocity, will have this kind of relationship. Um, so yeah, that's true. So in the outer solution, you know, we actually have no vertical velocity because we don't have a boundary layer that's developing. So this uh, v is equal to u infinity delta over l. This is only valid in the inner solution. Uh, so that's not going to be valid outside, because outside we have basically just strictly horizontal velocity. Any more questions on uh, on this before we jump into momentum? Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and jump into. Oh, right. Okay, so we have a question of you know we have multiple ways of scaling the pressure term. Uh, so how do we know which uh, which scaling to use when? So that's that's a great question. Um, so a lot of times, you know, the way the, the reason that we know these pressure scalings is because of you know experiments that we did. Okay? Uh, 
um, because event because essentially pressure is going to be a force over an area, right? Kind of as we've always said. Uh, so there's lots of different um, you know quantities in, in fluid flow that has a force over an area. So we've talked about um, the viscous stress, obviously. So viscous stress is a uh, is a is also a force over an area, right? Um, but there's also a lot of other things like this uh, this inertia term. So even though this doesn't look like a force over an area, if you actually work out the units for you know density multiplied by velocity squared, then this will give you also the units of force over an area. So it's all you know. So the, you know how you pick one over the other is that you look at these kind of various things. So you know this one right here, this rho u uh, infinity squared. This is a inertia scaling, right? Because basically rho u infinity squared that's some measure of the inertia. So if you look at kind of the, uh, you know, you measure these, these, these kind of quantities in your flow, which is, uh, you know, the amount of inertia that you have, the amount of viscous stress, basically whichever one is the highest, that's kind of the one that you pick for the pressure scale. So, you know, I kind of started this by saying that, you know, you would only know this if you actually did experiments, because a lot of times, you know, you won't know, you know, what's kind of the biggest thing unless you do experiments. Um, but, you know, for these kind of cases where you know U infinity is going to be really, really high, then, um, you know, that's, that's how we know that inertia is going to be uh, important. Yeah, but that's a great question. So a lot of times, you know, a lot of experimental fluids, what they, what they often are looking for are different ways to kind of scale these kinds of phenomena, um, you know, for different kinds of situations. Because, you know, these, these kinds of ones that we go over in the class, those are kind of the main ones. But if you have kind of a more complex, you know, especially engineering situations, there might be other ways that you can scale the pressure, you know, that might be more appropriate. But that's, you know, that's, that's a subject of a lot of, you know, really, um, you know, really good research. All right, any more questions on this? Okay. Okay, so let's jump into the momentum equation. So let's take, you know, all the scalings that we did and plug it into our X momentum. Uh, so first of all, just to save us a little bit of, of, uh, of time, let's consider a steady solution, okay? So, you know, at first, uh, or in the actual solution, we have a du dt out here, but we're not gonna consider that. Um, you know, we did unsteady flow. And we know that with unsteady flow, we can only do uh, some very, very um, simple situations. So this is the opposite of a simple situation. So we're just going to ignore that. Okay. Uh, so if we do that, then we get these terms. Um, so I've kind of basically skipped the steps where I've, I've plugged in for all of the dimensional variables. So for the first convective term, which is u du dx, then we get what we get is uh, u infinity squared over L. Okay, so that's the that's the term that comes out. Uh, the next term is going to be v um, du dy. So if we plug in for v, which is what we got right here, okay, and then we plug in for u and we plug in for y, then this is what we get. Okay? So we get u uh, delta over L, which is our v scaling, right? And we have u infinity over delta. And what we see is that these two deltas are going to cancel out. So we have u infinity squared over L, so same as this guy. Uh, next, we have the pressure term. So if we use this pressure scaling right here, along with the scaling for x, right, um, then what we get is u infinity squared over L. So so far everything has the same scaling. Okay? And then for the uh, for the other terms, for the use uh, d squared u dx squared, we have u infinity over L squared. And then for the d squared u dy squared, we have u infinity over delta squared. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of another thing that you would know just kind of based on experiments. But because, you know, in this boundary layer situations, we often have, you know, outside the boundary layer, we have flow that's really, really fast. So, you know, so that's, you know, inertia is going to be really high. Uh, so, you know, when we have really high inertia, we know that that inertia has to be balanced by the, uh, by the viscous stresses. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to divide by this uh, U infinity squared over L. Okay. And get everything in terms of uh, you know everything else in terms of a uh, uh, coefficient of one. Okay? So if we do that, then we see that the convective terms they all have a coefficient of one in front because they have the same coefficient here. Right? Uh, we see that the pressure term, which had the same coefficient, it also has a coefficient of one right here. Okay? So we can leave those, and then the viscous terms um, will have this kind of scaling. Okay? So there's you know there's a little bit of algebra involved here. But if you pull out these terms, you have L nu over U infinity over delta squared. Then what you end up getting is a delta squared over L squared times D squared U star DX star squared plus D squared U star DY star squared. 
Uh, so that's kind of what you get after plugging in all the schemas. Okay. Um, and so what you can do is you can simplify this a bit. Um, so if you define the Reynolds number to be u infinity L over nu, okay, um, then what you can say is that you can kind of replace this situation here by this one right here. Um, and then once you get the sim, uh, the, simula um, the equation in this form, what you can do is you can simplify it even further by remembering that the boundary layer thickness is really, really small. Um, so, um, but we're, we're also going to assume that the Reynolds number is something that's really, really high, right? Because remember, we have really high flow that's outside our boundary layer. So when we have really, really high flow, then the Reynolds number is going to be really, really high. So after we perform kind of all those kind of cancellations, right, um, you know, and we make sure that we don't lose this viscous term, okay, um, because this viscous term right here, this that's going to represent changes of the velocity in the y direction, okay. And since we know that the velocities are going to change rapidly in there, we also we need to keep that um, back there. Uh, so in order to do that, if we look at this coefficient is L nu u over u infinity delta squared, which was the same coefficient that was in our original equation. Right? So that was the coefficient given by this guy right here. So in order to make sure that this term doesn't go away, because we, we need to keep this term right here, then we need to ensure that this term right here has the same kind of scaling as the rest of the terms. So since we know that the u star, the convective terms, um, you know, u star, du star, dx squared, plus V star du star dy squared and the pressure term. All of these have coefficient of one, right? In order for this viscous term to survive, then this term right here also needs to be, have kind of this order of one. So what we say is that this quantity right here, L nu over U infinity delta squared, this is on the order of one. So if we manipulate this equation a little bit, then what we can say is that delta squared over L squared, that's going to be proportional to nu, to nu over U infinity times L. Okay? Where this U infinity over L, this is going to be the same as one over the Reynolds number. Okay? So that was kind of a lot of steps. So let me kind of, uh, you know, recap that. Um, so, you know, after we apply all of our scaling laws, we end up with this equation right here. Um, so we get the convective terms, the pressure term, they all have coefficient of one. And then we get this guy for the viscous term. Right? So we know that just from kind of experiments and just the fact that we're in a viscous fluid flow class, that we need to maintain at least one of the viscous terms, right? So we know that most of the time we, we don't consider this guy. Right? So we're just going to give up on him, say that, you know, we tried our best, but, you know, you're kind of a lost cause, so you know, goodbye. Um, but we need to at least maintain this term right here, this d squared u dy squared. Okay. The only, the kind of the barrier in front of this term is that we have this coefficient here, this L nu over u infinity delta squared. Okay. So in order for this term to hang out with kind of the other cool kids club over here, its coefficient also needs to be a co um, on the order of one. Okay. So what we're enforcing in the boundary layer equations is that we're enforcing that that coefficient, L nu over u infinity delta squared, this has to be kind of on the order of one in order for our viscous term to survive. Okay? And then by manipulating this term a little bit, so we move this delta squared on top and we move this L on the bottom, right? And then we multiply both sides by one over L. Then what we get is um, delta over L squared is proportional to nu over uh, U infinity over L, which is gonna be one over Uh, are there any any questions on on that? Yeah. So I know I know it's a little bit hand wavy just because you know, I'm, I, it feels like I'm kind of playing God on you know deciding which terms get to survive or not. But you know a lot of these are you know kind of as we said before these are kind of supported by kind of experiments that people have done. Kind of over the years. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So we're almost there. Okay. Um, so if we do that, then we can say that the only term that actually goes away in our uh, in our horizontal momentum 
is going to be this guy. Okay. He was voted off the island. Okay. So if we do that, then what we're left with in the horizontal direction is this. So actually, you know, we barely simplified it at all. So we have both our convective terms. We have u du dx plus v du dy is equal to minus one over rho dp dx plus nu du d squared u dy squared. Okay. So we have almost everyone here except for that, uh, that one viscous term in the x direction. Okay. And then I didn't go over here, but you can, you can run the same arguments for the y momentum equation. So this is y mom, right? So if you do that, then you kind of get the usual result. If you ignore gravity, right? So if you ignore gravity, then what you get is dp dy is equal to zero. Uh, so what you basically um, say is that the pressure does not vary in the y direction at all. Um, that's kind of a uh, kind of a you know a result that we're kind of familiar. With. So then if you combine that together with the, uh, um, you know, with this one, then we can, we can kind of simplify this a little bit. So in particular, uh, you know, we, we didn't go over it explicitly in this class, so there, there's, there's kind of a footnote in one of the earlier um, notes, is that there's this other really famous equation in fluid mechanics called the Bernoulli equation. Okay? So the Bernoulli's equation is, a, it's basically an expression of conservation of energy in a, in a fluid uh, system. Uh, so this is conservation of energy. Okay. Um, you know, and and you know, we're not thinking, we're not using it that much in this class, just because one of this one of the situation or one of the requirements for using Bernoulli is that it has to be in this city. So viscid basically means that there's no viscosity. Um, so you know, obviously we can't use that in this class as we this is a viscid fluid flow class, so there's always going to be viscosity. Um, so you know, most of the time Bernoulli's equation is not going to be useful for us for the kinds of situations that we're looking at. But for boundary layers, we're in a very kind of unique situation because you know we have this kind of two zone uh, two zone thing going on because inside the boundary layer, we can see right here. In the inner solution, right? in the inner solution, what we see right here is that viscous effects are really important, okay? which is you know kind of what we've been saying. But in the outer solution out here, outside the boundary layer, right, what we say is that viscous effects are actually negligible at all. So we have no viscous effects at all. So what we can do in the outer solution here is that we can actually use the Bernoulli equation. So the question is, you know, why would we want to do that, right? Because it actually, you know, helps simplify this a little bit, okay? Because what we have right now is we have this kind of beast of an equation. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, we've gone through this kind of exercise of scaling it, but we've barely simplified it at all. Uh, so, you know, right now it's not that useful, um, but we can make it slightly less useless by, by invoking Bernoulli's equation, okay? Um, so Bernoulli's equation, um, you know, if you've never seen it before, it looks like this. So Bernoulli's equation says that the pressure, so this P up here, this is pressure. Okay. In my terrible mouse handwriting. Okay. And on the bottom here, we have density. So that's a rho. Okay. So we say that the ratio of density over rho plus one half U infinity squared uh, so here we have a pressure term, and here we have our inertia term, right? So basically, anytime you see velocity squared, that's basically kind of the same thing as momentum or inertia, okay? Um, so what Bernoulli's equation says is that if you have no viscosity um, and some other, uh, some other, you know, um, some other requirements for Bernoulli, but kind of the most important one is no viscosity, that the sum of these two terms are going to be constant. Okay? Uh, and so what we can do is that let's let's take this equation right here and let's take the derivative with respect to x. Okay, so we're going to take each of the terms individually here and take the derivative with respect to x. Okay? So if we do that for the first term right here, right? So we know that the density is a constant, so the density comes out of the integral. 
So we have one over the density times dp dx. Right? So hopefully this looks familiar. This looks like this guy. Right? So we're going to be making a substitution. Uh, and then when we take the derivative of one half u um, uh, infinity squared, we have to use the uh, the chain rule. So what? How we chain rule this is we do two times u infinity. Okay. So the two comes out in front and cancels out with the one half, and we get a u infinity. And then since the u infinity, we we kind of made no assumptions on that. We assume that u infinity can also change with x. Okay. So by doing the chain rule, we get u infinity times d u infinity dx. Okay. And on the right-hand side, since we have a constant, we have no idea what the constant is, but we honestly don't care at all. Okay. Because when we take the derivative of a constant, it just goes to zero. Okay. And so what we get is that one over the density times the um, pressure gradient um, is equal to u infinity d u, u infinity dx. Okay. And so what we can do is that you know since we we have this pressure term and we usually don't like pressure, um, we can get rid of it by replacing one over rho d infinity uh, d p dx by u infinity d u infinity dx. Okay. So if we plug this guy in for uh, dp dx right here. Okay. Then we get um, what's called the Prandtl version of the, uh, the boundary wave functions. Okay. So we have our convective terms u d u dx plus v d u d y is equal to u infinity d u infinity dx, where this is the newest substitution that which we did from the Bernoulli equation, okay. plus new d squared u d y squared. And this right here is our uh, boundary layer equation that we're going to be working, uh, which is discovered by Prent. So he gets to, he has to put his name. Right. Any questions on uh, on this version of the boundary layer equation <coughs> we have so far? Any questions from from the Zoom? Okay, so that's the uh, uh, the boundary layer equation. So this will kind of be our, our launching point um, for uh, for the Blasius solution, which I think we'll get to start a little bit today, right? But before we do that, we uh, you know we have our a differential equation here, and we know that whenever we have a differential equation, we always need boundary conditions. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the boundary conditions that um, that are going to be applied on this flow. Um, so mathematically, we won't actually be applying these because it's even with this kind of simple I call this kind of simplified form. Uh, it's still going to be really hard to solve, right? uh, but it's good to actually know what the uh, the boundary conditions are. Okay? So at the surface, you know, we have our usual no slip condition. So no slip basically means that all the velocity um, components go to zero. Okay? So now we have two velocity components. We have both u and v. Okay? So when you evaluate u and v at y is equal to zero, or y is equal to zero is going to be at the plate surface or at our solid surface, then the velocity has to equal to zero there. Um, and then far away from the plate, um, as y goes to infinity, so we have u as x and y goes to infinity, um, then we say that our u is going to be equal to the free stream velocity. Because okay? remember, in our boundary layer situation, we have you know, very fast flow that's going over our plate. So you know, as, the, as we get away from the plate, then the fluid kind of joins this kind of free stream condition. Okay? Uh, so those are just kind of very quickly on the boundary condition. So we, you know, we kind of already kind of talked about this since we already know that we have no slip at the plate, and then far away from the boundary condition we have the free stream. But you know, just mathematically, that's just kind of how you apply it. And the equation that you would actually apply it to is this one. Okay. Any questions on on boundary conditions here? Okay. So I, so since I have the exam today, and, and I, I actually kind of don't because Blasius, I think will. You know, I think it's good to kind of do that on kind of one fresh, um, you know, lecture. I think I'll, I'll end lecture a little bit early today. Okay. Uh, so for those of you guys that are on Zoom, uh, I know I know today wasn't the most ideal just because, you know, I was, this is the lecture notes that you guys already have, and I was just kind of scribbling on it with the mouse, which uh, which was semi-legible sometimes on a, on a good uh, on a good line. So, um, you know, on, on, uh, on Wednesday, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, improve this. What I'm hoping is that, uh, I have some kind of, I kind of link to this kind of console right here. You guys don't see it on the, on the Zoom, but there's, there's kind of a, basically like an overhead projector, but not really since those don't exist anymore, where I can uh, basically write with kind of just like a normal pencil and paper, 
and kind of develop the notes kind of in real time. I think that'll be hopefully easier to follow than, than Canvas. So I know this wasn't ideal, um, but I'm hoping that by Wednesday I'll get that working. So I tried to get into classrooms on Friday to kind of test this out, but literally all the classrooms were slammed on Friday because all the faculty were trying to test stuff out. So um, what they told me is that you're young, you can figure this out. So I didn't get to, uh, I didn't get to try anything out. So, uh, so tomorrow I'm going to come early. I'm going to try stuff out and Wednesday we'll, we'll have this kind of working better for me. So, uh, so I apologize for, you know, the technical difficulties today and, you know, we'll make this work better in the future. Um, so, you know, for those of you guys on zoom, you know, we're going to be doing this for the foreseeable future. So, uh, you know, if you have any feedback for me, uh, you know, I think the thing I'm most concerned about right now is the audio. Um, so if there's any parts that were kind of difficult for you to hear or things that I can do better, uh, definitely let me know. In terms of the kind of on-screen stuff, you know, I'm going to be working on that. But, you know, just in terms of the audio and just the pace at which I was going, then uh, just let me know about that. Okay, question. Uh, you said that you discussed the project on Zoom on last week or not? This class doesn't have a project. Uh, yeah, because in the syllabus there's a project. Oh, okay. Project. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forgot to. So this. Um, so the question was, you know, um, is there going to be a project? So, uh, so right now the plan is to not have a project. Uh, so the plan is to have a final exam. Since I know for a lot of you guys, um, you know, you um, you guys are taking the comp exam, so I want to make sure you guys get some, you know, some good practice with some good test questions to do that. Um, <laughs> extra credit. Extra credit. The question was, is there an extra credit project? And the answer is no. <laughs> um, I mean, if you want to do a thesis, that's a different thing. But uh, no, we're not going to do any extra credit for Because I think you know, there's already kind of a lot that people are going through. So the thing with extra credit, so extra credit was always kind of interesting to me in college because I felt like there was no such thing as extra credit. Because everything's based on you know, kind of relative to how the class was. So if one person has extra credit, then we all got to do extra credit. Because then you know, it's basically like an extra assignment or something. Like that. So you know, I, I, I usually don't like to do that, but it's uh, you know, uh, so that's kind of my, my stance on that right now. Okay, uh, so with that, I'll end the class. So if you're here and you haven't picked up your midterms, then come pick it up. Uh, so if you're on Zoom and you want me to scan your midterms, then just send me an email uh, and then I'll, I'll scan it probably tomorrow morning. Uh, so I'll, I'll be signing off. So, uh, so thanks everyone for joining and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.